so much pressure. I mean, I get on the line, you have Allison Felix, Lauren Williams, Carmen Lita Jetter, and yeah. they're all in your heat. And you're like, wait, how am I going to be top four when I got the top three girls in the world in the lane next to me? That means only one spot left. Yeah. Um, and I had the NCAA champion in my heat um, one time as well. And, and the gun goes off. We all crossed the line. This is that 2007 USA championship. This was nine months after I left my job at YNR. And I really needed to make this team to put me on that path of being considered one of the top contenders for the upcoming games the next year. Yeah. And so when I'm lined up like that and you have all that pressure, all that pressure, you have to have a way out. And so it was really important for me to be able to have those tools in my tool belt to just get myself, like whip myself right back into my focus and understanding my power and understanding my ability. Welcome to the Evolution of Leaders podcast. My name is Darwin Lee and I am a coach and speaker. I'm the founder of the Evolution of Leaders. On this podcast, I'm interested in exploring the traits, habits, or behaviors that set apart elite performers through their stories and in their own words. On this episode, I interview Michelle Lewis Freeman, a world champion in the 4x100 meter relay with Team USA. She has an incredible story of someone who is climbing the ranks in the sprinting world, but then gets injured, gets a job in corporate America, and then incredibly decides to return to sprinting. And basically, she's not training for three years, makes the Olympic team in two. So how does someone go from a sedentary lifestyle to, to someone who's named to Team USA, becomes a world champion, has the Olympics where uh, they're favored for, for a medal, but then something devastating happens and uh, just a, a, an amazing story, an amazing journey, and uh, such a great uh, guest, a terrific example of, of focus, of commitment, and of sacrifice. I hope you enjoy this interview. Michelle, yeah. welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for that intro. <laughs> So, Michelle, I'm wondering if you can take us through just if you could describe your career in one minute, how how'd you might do that. Oh, my goodness. One minute. Uh, um, you know, I would say, you know, you just continue to evolve. You know, you, you, you find yourself in different stages um, as you you grow and develop as a person. And track and field has impacted my life since I was a young girl through my collegiate years and making an Olympic team in my late twenties, you know, now evolving, using the sport to help uh, as a coach and help guide the next generation um, in the sport um, that way, but also, you know, um, finding that I wanted to impact lives through track girls um, has now been my focus um, over the last couple of years now that I'm officially 40 for uh, 30 days now. So, you know, I think I can just sum up my career as, you know, just like a constant evolution of of who I am at the core and track and field has been a part of that. And, and so luckily I'm able to use that to continue to impact lives from being an athlete to a coach to a philanthropist and just continue to do that today and hopefully in the future. That's so awesome. And congratulations on 40. And here you are with, with your twin sister. And uh, <laughs> you you were known as, as, as the Lewis sisters and, and you're both super fast, really well known. And unfortunately, she sustained a career ending injury. Yeah. But I mean, you uh, there's something interesting about you before we get into kind of your Olympic career. And that is and that is this, as a freshman, you had a 4.0. And then as a senior, you were, you were named top 25 most promising minority students by the American Advertising Federation. So not only were you one of the fastest women in the world, but you're also one of the smartest. And so what I wanted to ask you was, how do you lead yourself successfully, whether it's a track or boardroom or whatever, because you do, you do a lot of things right. Well, you know... I actually, you know, never heard anyone ever bring up those statistics outside. They should. Of, you know, yeah. They should. My goodness. I'm impressed. Um, you know, growing up, I, I thought, you know, I saw the movie Boomerang. I don't know if, if, if you've seen that movie or yeah, yeah. whoever is listening has ever seen that movie, but it was uh, Eddie Murphy and Robin Givens and Holly Berry. And, and but he he works at an advertising agency. Yeah, yeah. And 
they are out there making these um, crazy campaigns and I, I saw the movie and I was like, I want to do that, you know? And so I, I went to college, University of South Carolina. Yeah, so I, had a, I have a twin sister and we were known as the Lewis twins, like you said, but now we're known as the Freeman twins because we both married Freemans. And oh, so, awesome. Yes, right. So now we're the Freeman twins, but we ran together growing up and went to the University of South Carolina together. Like you said, she had her career in the injury in South Carolina um, and I continued to run from there. But at South Carolina, that's when I started to study advertising. I always um, was a smart child, not to like toot my own horn, but I had 4.0s in sixth grade through high school, um, always was on the honor roll. And my mom just wanted to make sure I was well balanced. She used to always say, you know, you can have, you can be fast or you can be, um, you know, one of the greatest athletes, but you need to always make sure you have a plan outside of sports. And so I always mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that balance was there. So I, I, I handled what I needed to do in the classroom as well as I did on the track. Um, and, and while I was in college, it was one of the top journalism programs in the country. And I focused wow. on the advertising track and I had to do a mandatory internship. And I, so I went to work at y in New York. It was one of the top ad agencies in the world. Um, and so I had a great opportunity to do that. And, and while I was there, uh, you know, I worked there for two years before deciding to leave that amazing job to quit my job and go and try and obtain making this uh, Olympic team in two years. So, um, you know, I knew I wanted to do things on and off the track. And so I always, you know, from what was instilled from my mom and, um, you know, just the determination within myself, I wanted to make sure I always had a path in life where I wasn't controlling my choices. And whenever track was taken away from me, because I ended my career with an injury. And so when I was in that position, um, I had a choice still, and I was still in control of my life. And that's when I decided to go back into advertising. And I, even though I was going to miss track, I never felt like I didn't know what was next for me. I always was, um, able to know and have options for myself. That's amazing. And, and, and we, we got to give your mom props, hey, uh, for, for instilling in that, in, that in, in you and your sister. And, and yeah. as we, as we move forward, you, you, uh, finished in 2002 and you had some injuries, uh, as, as sometimes happens in, in, in high level sports, unfortunately, but, uh, you weren't able to, to try out for the, uh, 2004 Olympics, but you kind of have a couple plans that that kind of backup plan that that you, that you follow. And so your plan A is is you're moving into the corporate world, mm -hmm. and and then and you talked about this a little bit, and then you make a decision to get back on the track. And from this, I can't I can't comprehend this. Uh, from 2003 to 2006, you're not really doing any exercise. And there's a hilarious quote from you in the Baltimore Sun where you hire a fitness coach. <laughs> and and he says, come back after yeah, you've had your baby, and yeah. you say, and you say, I'm not baby. pregnant. I'm not pregnant. Yeah, I'm just yeah. fat. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just a little. I had a little tummy, you know, a little tummy. You know what? Thinking back then, I don't even know if that was really a legit tummy. That was me in my young twenties, probably like used to my all out, you know, track and field full time training and a body being responsive to that lifestyle. Um, so I don't even know if I had officially had a real pooch, but it wasn't just what I was used to. And, and uh, you know, like I said, I was working at YNR. I wanted to go to the Olympic Games um, directly out of college. I graduated in 2002. The upcoming games were in 2004, but I was dealing with a hamstring injury. And that's when I decided to go um, to graduate school and um, focus more on advertising. So I, I was uh, getting my degree in integrated marketing communications. Mm -hmm. And that's when I moved to New York City to work at y &R, And I did that for two years before I decided to leave the job and say, I'm really going to go for 2008. And I would say the time in between 2002 and 2006, you know, when I was um, thinking about leaving y &R, that was four years of not working out and not, you know, used to, I'm used to that whole training regimen of that track. You know, you're working out six days a week. You're, you're in the weight room four to five times a week. And 
So none of that was happening in New York. It was more happy hours and hanging out with friends, magazine parties, photo shoots for, you know, work and long hours at the, at the computer. Um, so yeah, when I had that conversation with Coach Solomon, actually, when I had that conversation with Coach Solomon, yeah, I was feeling a little different about uh, my, my, my physical state. <laughs> and it, it seemed like you continued when you went back to your original plan, if we can say it that way, that you felt your purpose was not complete. And, and you quote um, Psalm 18, it is God who makes my feet feel like the feet of a deer. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can take us through kind of achieving your purpose and what you mm -hmm. felt you were called to do. Yeah. So, I mean, that time that, you know, during that four years that I had off, you know, a two years where we're in grad school, that two years that I was actually living in New York City, um, I was actually going through like this really bad breakup at this time. I was engaged to be married. Um, mm. And I went from being in that relationship to having nobody in New York. So it went from a whole, you know, one day you wake up and you were planning a wedding and, you know, he played for the New York Jets at the time. So I was going to football games on Sundays and, you know, traveling everywhere. And, you know, it was just a whole nother life that I was living during that time. And then I woke up, I moved to New York. And then two weeks later we broke up. And so, oh, man. yes. Okay. And so, you know, I still had to do, you know, I did this internship for grad school at the time and I had to make sure I finished that internship or I would not graduate. And so, you know, when I moved to New York, that time was really when I came into my faith, like, you know, as an adult, you know, growing up, you know, your parents are like, you got to go to church. You got to go to Sunday school. You got to go to choir rehearsal. Yeah. And so now at 23, you know, you can make your own choices on what you want to do. And so um, that's when I started to, on my own, seek um, a relationship with God and really lean on him to get me through that time of not really having anyone um, immediately surrounding me. My family, you know, I'm from Maryland. And so that's four hours away from New York. So I really didn't have anybody. I was by myself. And so it was a time of isolation in a time of where I really came into my own um, as an adult and as um, my relationship with God. And, and so every day I would just talk to God and, you know, he, I felt like he was actually listening to me. If I was praying about something, I can open up the Bible and like I can have an answer right there. And so I really felt that ebb and flow of a daily relationship with God, you know, and I, I started to use that. Um, and, and my outlook on life and understanding that I can do everything. If I say, if I'm, if I'm read with the, what the Bible says, and if I believe it, then that means that nothing is impossible for God. So that means that I can quit my job and I'm gonna make this Olympic team. And so that's wow. the outlook I had and the, the, the foundation that I had moving forward was rooted in that faith. Now, as you went forward, there is as you feel called to your purpose, if I can say it that way, it, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. You, uh, you have a quote here. I couldn't, you couldn't walk for the first week and it hurt to sneeze to laugh was painful. And the training was really intense. You're like, you're jumping right back on the treadmill, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, and you had to go through a lot. Um, you're, you're unknown. You have no sponsors. You now mm -hmm. have no job, no money. You get injured mm -hmm. again, just shortly after, after starting back into training, mm -hmm. you had to sacrifice a lot on, on the way to your dreams. Mm -hmm. What did you do mentally to move forward when the path is unclear and it feels like the dreams are, are, are far away, even beyond kind of what, what you can see right in front of you? What did you do? Right. So I had this term I heard from um, my, my pastor, Dr. Wesley Elam. And, um, I lost him a few years ago, um, but one of my greatest mentors and um, he told me, do it afraid. And he used it at one of his Bible studies. And so what he, what he meant by that is that, you know, the fear doesn't leave, but you just have to keep moving forward. And so I never forgot that. And so that's how I, I, I explain my journey to, to people is that like, you have to take that step and you have to do it, you know, bring the fear along for the ride. And, you know, once you take that first step, your faith will be acknowledged. And then the next step will be presented. But until you take that step, you know, you won't know. And so that's why you have to do it afraid to take that step. 
and then know that the next step will be provided and the next step will be provided. And that was the space that I was in at that time. Um, I was, you know, just moved to North Carolina. I left my job officially. Uh, I, I chose an environment. I always tell people you want to put yourself in an environment that supports uh, what you're trying to achieve and you're around people that are aligned to where you need to go. That's very important. And so if you ask yourself, you know, hey, is my environment the right, is, is it aligned with the, um, are the people aligned with what I'm, I'm trying to achieve? Is this, does this environment really um, give me, like, feed my soil to grow? And if that answer is ever no, then it has to be changed. It's just, it just has to be changed. And so when I was in North Carolina, I was in that environment to help me grow and develop in that area that I needed to, to really make an Olympic team. And it's not going to be easy. Along that path, I was losing races. I was getting injured. Um, I, I was facing top athletes in the world um, and I had to win against them. And so, again, that's when my faith, you know, what are you saying to yourself every day? You know, you have to be consistent in your actions and your words and uh, making sure your feet in the areas that need to grow and develop. Um, so, um, you know, what are you listening to? What podcasts are you listening to to feed those areas? What, what, um, what are you telling yourself? Like your, your, your personal statements or your, your motto, you know, mine was impossible was nothing. I used to have this, mm-hmm. um, a Muhammad Ali poster on my wall. I used to take it down, fold it up with me and all my track meets and put it up on the wall. Um, but I would say that to myself every morning in the car, if I'm driving, um, go, go, you know, while I was driving, um, before I go to bed at night, uh, when I'm writing my journals, you know, impossible is nothing, impossible is nothing. And so my body really came to trust what I was saying to myself because I was, I was consistent. And so I, I just would like to say, you know, make sure, um, that what you consistently are doing is adding up and supporting uh, the direction that you're trying to go because those choices, those daily habits will all add up to those moments of the, to those big moments of, of um, you know, of change. You, and, and that's what was happening for me. Like every day, feeding, feeding, feeding those areas of growth. And then you got to think about, you got to starve also, you got to starve what needs to die, any habits that need to die, anything that's going against where you're trying to go. You got to starve those areas just as much as you got to feed the ones that you need to grow. And that's fascinating. Thank you. What were some of those things that you had to starve out of your life? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I mean, if you think about, you know, the, when you talk about the sacrifice, like you were just mentioning, you know, my 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 schedule was looking like waking up and at 6 a.m. and making sure you had everything was calculated so making sure you took the exact amount of protein and carbohydrates you needed so your workout could um be what it needed to be so when you come talk about those sacrifices um you know you may not be able to eat everything you want to eat or go to the places that you want to go because you have to get, you know, not eight to 10 hours of sleep every night. And somebody was having a get together and you knew you would not get that eight to 10 hours, then you're not going to that get together. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you know that at night you had to stick to what you needed to eat for that night. And that meant no sugar, then it's no sugar. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, I mean, on a daily basis, it's just sacrifices from, uh, just, you know, I'm taking supplements all throughout the day. I, I got to make sure I'm hitting my hydration number. I got to make sure I'm sitting in my ice bath three times a week. I got to make sure that every day I'm showing up to the track, my body is ready to perform its best. And so you just have to make sure every day you're preparing yourself to deliver that. And that's going to come with giving up a lot of things. And, and so I would say if I just had to starve a lot of things, it's just going to be those, you know, that you're 20. 25, you know, and so you're, you're sacrificing and starving a lot of like that social, um, social lifestyle. And then you're starving some of the habits of what you think or what you tell yourself, you know, the, some of those, those things that are, aren't feeding those, oh, I, I can do everything. Nothing is impossible. Anything that goes against that, that's, those thoughts need to be starved. Ah, interesting. Okay. When you came back and, 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 you know, you're, you're initially, you're losing a lot of races. Mm-hmm. What do you do to 
you know, when you encounter the setbacks, the obstacles, the hurdles, what do you do to, to go forward, to take lessons and go forward? There, is, there, is it a mindset or, or, or do, is there something you do or journaling, reflecting? What are some of those things? Oh, every day. I mean, journaling a 100%, you know, making sure that you're writing down what you want for yourself, what you see for yourself. Um, again, doodling, impossible is nothing on every, every page. Uh, making sure, like, you know, when you're on the radio, you know, the things that you're listening to is, you know, whether but for me, you know, whether that was sometimes a sermon um, to help, you know, develop my faith in those areas or any books that I was reading, you know, any books I was, I would read um, not only faith based books, but um, I will also read books like Law of Attraction. Uh, making sure that I understood that every thought that I put out there, whether negative or positive, um, has energy. And so you want to make sure that as soon as it materializes as a thought, that it is is building in that direction and building on, on that path that you want to go. Um, so, I mean, all of these habits, you know, as you're losing, um, as I was losing, I'm able, since I'm feeding myself in those things, then I always had content to defeat it. You know, whether it was a scripture, oh, um, nothing formed against me shall prosper. You know, if I was getting injured or if I'm scared, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my strength. Whom should I be afraid? You know, I would say those things on the starting line, oh. uh, you know, or if you got that moment and, and you feel like, oh my goodness, you look at your heat. And you have the top three girls in the world in your heat and they only take them four, you know, like what are those things that you're saying to yourself every day that when you're in the heat of battle, that when you tell yourself what you tell yourself every day in that moment, that you trust it because the key is that you have to trust it in, in the, in the heat of the battle. So that like you're still able to stay poised, still able to keep your composure, still able to trust that you're able to do this. And so when your body starts going away from that and your mind starts going away from that, um, then you're able to like reel it in really quickly with everything that you've been feeding yourself. And that's your body's like, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, impossible is nothing. Oh, that's right. I can do all things. That's right. Who shall I fear? The Lord is my light, my salvation. He's my strength. Whom shall I? Why am I scared? of my, my competitor. So it's, it's just those things every day. And so that's why I just reiterate the consistency of your actions and the consistency of your daily choices, because it all adds up to being like that big difference maker in that one moment. It's interesting. You mentioned about how you approach trials and races, because when in 2007, you know, like you're lining up and uh, there's, I mean, it's, it's a, a competitive field, very, very competitive women, uh, on the starting line. And, and, uh, you mentioned, you know, lining up with Olympic and world champion, Allison Phoenix, she's there and mm -hmm. it's all these, the fastest uh, women in, in the U S and in the world. Mm -hmm. And so really you're going through, um, sort of your, your mantra mantras and some of these things that you're affirming yourself with. Is, is that right? Is that how you calm yourself in a situation like that? When, when yeah. there's so much pressure? So much pressure. I mean, I get on the line, you have Allison Felix, Lauren Williams, Carmen Lita Jetter, and yeah. um, they're all in your heat. And you're like, wait, how am I going to be top four when I got the top three girls in the world in the lane next to me? That means only one spot left. Yeah. Um, and I had the NCAA champion in my heat um, one time as well. And, um, and, and the gun goes off. We all crossed the line. This is at 2007 USA championships. This was nine months after I left my job at y &R, And I really needed to make this team to put me on that path of being considered one of the top contenders for the upcoming games the next year. Yeah. And so when I'm lined up like that and you have all that pressure, all that pressure, you have to have a way out. And so it was really important for me to be able to have those tools in my tool belt to just get myself like whip myself right back into my focus and understanding my power and understanding my ability. Um, and when I realized my power again, like, no, you, you have it, you're equipped. And then I'm able to be like, yeah, you're right. That's right. And then you can go um, out there and perform how you need to. And that pressure um, is immediately released because again, it's about the consistency of it. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. That's right. That's right. Impossible is nothing. And then I crossed the line 
you know, top three names go up, of course, Allison, Lauren, Carmelita. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> one more name left. Yeah. And then they put my name up and it says Michelle Lewis. And I beat the girl who got fifth place by a thousandth of a second. Oh, and so man. that's why I tell everybody, you know, the choices you make every day, um, the things that you commit to every day, they all matter. And so you want to make sure that you're on the right side of that thousands of a second. You make the team and, and the, the amazing thing is, is that, you know, you're world champ and congratulations, you know, um, and you're world champion 2007, a year after, after you're starting your get back into training. And then you're at the Olympics two years later and you're beating out women who are very talented and have been training basically in a four year cycle. Mm -hmm. And so what did you, and you've talked about some of these things, but what are some of the things you, you, you could say kind of differentiated yourself and allowed you to, to maybe, you know, to surpass, I, I don't, I don't want to put anyone down here, but that's what I'm saying. It's just, you did something to differentiate yourself, to enable yourself really with minimal training in, in one of the most difficult sports in the world. It's just, run, it's, it's running and, and you know, so I mean, how many people run yeah. tens of thousands? Know. Right. Yeah. I, you know, um, it's something that if I would say a differentiator, um, I mean, everyone has, you know, everybody wants it, you know, everybody puts in work, but I, the biggest difference for me between when I was a collegiate competitor to when I was a professional athlete was my, that mindset. Like it was my faith. And I can remember lining up in college and Sometimes I can run a fast time the week before and then a week later, somebody who was like ranked top in the country is in the lane next to me and I will lose because I will let that get in my head. But now, you know, being in that same position where I, you know, have somebody like an Allison Felix or um, a Lauren Williams next to me, then now with those those that mental capacity to be like, oh, I, I got this or that consistency of pouring into myself to build and develop my mindset and my faith. That was now something that I could apply when that fear would creep up, you know, in my throat. And I can I can have it, something to, to go against it, that, that tool to go against it just that quickly. Um, so besides, you know, being having the talent, of course, you know, you need that. Um, but I, I would say the biggest difference, the biggest difference that I, I, I had was that whole, my faith and my mindset a hundred percent was the biggest difference. Wow. Going forward to the Olympics, what's, what's interesting is that the, there's a pool of women that are chosen for, for the relay team. And for, <laughs> this is strange for maybe some of us that are, that are not used to how things work at the elite level in track. The team is not identified until very late in the process in, in Beijing and, and, and you as runners don't know who is going to be uh, running and, and which leg. And you've got family flying in from all over the world and, yeah. and, and they're not knowing that you may not run. Right. Uh, and so you have to be ready. And how do, you, how do you prepare yourself in a situation like that where you may not know whether you're running or not, you know there's an opportunity, but you mm -hmm. don't know whether whether it will come your way. What do you do? How do you approach that? Oh, okay. Well, that was a buildup from that whole year. I would say Olympic year. So coming off world championships, I know I went on after making that world championship team to, um, we won the gold in the four by one. I finished ninth in the world in a hundred. I went on to run at Pan Am games and win double silvers there. So um, I was going into Olympic year as now someone, you know, being considered um, as one of the top athletes in, in the U.S. And so, you know, that first year, I mean, first month I came back from world championships, I get hurt and I can't run um, and because I can't bend my knee. I end up finding out that I have IT band syndrome. And so that day of pain turns into weeks of pain, into months of pain. So uh, Olympic year, I didn't even touch the track from September of 07 through January of 08. Yeah. And so that was four months of not yeah. being able to do what you say you want to be the best in the world at. Uh, so, you know, you got to, again, that's when you got to go back to like, what can I control? Controlling the controllables, you know, what are you, 
I, I, I couldn't run, but I could swim. You know, I could run in the pool. So I would trick my body and to like whatever I had to do on the track, I would do the same thing in the pool. I would get an aqua belt and you can just go in the deep end and run in the water. And I would um, just whatever I had for practice, I would do the same thing in the pool. And then like making sure every day, like mentally feeding myself again, what am I growing in those areas of like, I can do all things and making sure I'm reading the right things, educating myself on different brain training techniques, visualizing myself at the trials, visualizing myself making the team um, and really putting my mind and my body in those, um, in those, uh, the, the future, the desirable outcomes, right? Um, so when I got to the Olympic trials, I ended up making the team. I finished seventh overall. And so um, top three make it for the open event, but they wanted to bring some extra bodies for the relay. And so they brought every girl who made the final. So it brought all eight girls from the hundred meter into um, Beijing. And so my family knew I made the team and everyone knew I made the team. So everybody was booking their travel. But what they did not know is that there may be a chance that I may not run because it was eight girls and they only needed four. Although six can run because you can have two girls that run in the prelims that don't and change them out in the final. Um, so I didn't know if I was going to be one of the top six. OK, or if they were going to even have six or four or five, you know. So I went on and to um, in Beijing and I coached, you know, he we had opening ceremonies the next day and he was like, you know what, I want to have one more practice. And we were about three hours out from Beijing and he was like, you can either fly back and, and go back for opening ceremonies or you can stay here and we'll have one more relay practice. And so I was like, ah, so of course I miss opening ceremonies uh, because I only had one goal, you know, and that was for me to be chosen. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, my family booked tickets, you know, my mom was kind of landing in China. <laughs> my, uh, now husband was coming uh, to China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I had to like make something work. <laughs> and so here we are two days before, uh, the race and we finally get the call to come and, and find out if we're being selected to run or not. And, um, it was the same day that my family was landing in China. So I knew I was about to have the best conversation in my life or the worst conversation in my life. And I, I sat down and <laughs> they told me, uh, you know, they finally just said it. They said, Lewis, you're running second leg. And so I just will never forget that moment because it was a, a moment of pure gratefulness. And when I was able to have that conversation with my mom about, you know, running, I mean, she literally had no idea what I had just gone through because the time period between the Olympic trials and the Olympic games is about three weeks to a month. Yeah. And so I had about a month of time to like prove why I should be the one uh, running. And I, I was able to do that. What did you do to prove yourself? You, you'd ran, you ran seventh and, mm -hmm. and they, but they chose you. Mm -hmm. And so you opted to skip the opening ceremonies and mm -hmm. you went to, that mini camp. Yeah, we have our training camp. And, you know, I come from a relay program, South Carolina, Coach Fry. Um, he's a very um, respected coach in, in track and field. And his program is one of the top programs in the country. And we brought the first national championship in any sport to our university. We were always known for our relays at South Carolina. So I'm a relay. I'm a relay girl. Like I know how to get the <laughs> baton around the track. Um, and I know how to run any leg. I can run first leg, second leg, third leg, fourth leg. Um, I know how to handle the exchange as well. And so um, if you're able to show that, I mean, the four by one, the 100 is one event. The four by one is another event. And one of the major part of the four by one is being able to handle the um, baton well. And I was able to prove that. So in that month of time, I was able to show my, um, my accountability in the zone. Um, and my speed. I mean, in the U.S., the top eight girls in the U.S. can be the top girls in the world. Right. Because if you make the top three girls in the U.S., um, that next, what, fourth through eighth can still have faster times than some of the girls that make the Olympic team in other countries in their open 100. It's just that the U.S. has so many fast girls that you really, um, it's tough to make an Olympic team. It's known as the hardest team to make in track and field. And so even though I finished seventh, 
Um, the speed was, you know, one of the, that, that was known, um, but it was more about proving to the coaches that you're very um, durable in the exchange zone. Ah, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what you did in that camp was important. Yes. It was very okay. important. Yeah. I you see. Gotta show, like, yeah. Oh, she can run curves. Oh, she can run straightaways. Oh, she's really good. We know she can get the stick around the track. And so if you can show that, then you can, it's hard for them to say no to that. Yeah. Okay. I see. And then to, to, to the race itself, uh, th- there's an interesting event that happens where the b- baton is dropped and it's a hard, you know, heartbreaking moment. And when it all happens and it wasn't you that dropped the baton, but when it happens, it's, it's hard. And I'm wondering how you be a good teammate in a situation like that. Like it might be hard uh, in a situation like that, you know, to lash out, to be angry and stuff like that. But um, it, it seemed like you really supported your teammates. And so I, I wanted to ask you kind of how you got through that moment. And, and it, it, it sounds like, it seems like you, you really try to be a, a good support and a good teammate. And I'm wondering how you did that. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we were, you know, it was supposed to be between us and Jamaica that, that Olympic games, you know, Jamaica was having a, an amazing Olympic games. Usain Bolt was coming out and breaking the records and the 100 and the 200 world records. Um, the Jamaican women, they swept the podium in the 100 uh, meters. And so we were having a, actually a tough Olympic games as far as the medal count for our, our for our track and field federation. Um, and, but the relays usually is a staple event for us. Uh, and so we were hoping that we can come in and depend on those medals for us to add to our medal count. But, you know, the men went out first, they go out and they drop the baton from three to four. And so now we're like, Oh gosh, the men just dropped the stick. You know, we got to go out there and, and do our job. So we didn't have too much motivation coming, uh, 20 minutes before we got on the track. Um, so then, you know, it's our turn. I remember walking out in the stadium, there's over 90,000 people there. Um, and it, the, the crowd is, they're saying this chant, like together, it was like this war chant of a sort, like everyone is in sync and, you know, you got USA flags, they're screaming USA. So I remember taking this moment in, you know, you're thinking about this moment since you're a, a girl and you're saying you're going to make the Olympics and now that moment was here. So um, I was taking that all in. And again, it's a moment of gratitude um, that I, I was, I remember being overwhelmed with. And I get to my position on the track, I ended up being, like I said, selected for second leg. So the gun goes off and Angie's coming around the turn. Um, I put my hand back, I feel the stick. So I go, I get it. I'm running down a back stretch since we're in lane two. I want to pass everybody in front of me. So trying to pass three, I pass four, pass five, you know, I keep passing and I'm, I just get to my person, Tori. And I'm like, okay, Shell, you just got to get the stick across. I mean, stick, um, pass to her. And so she gets the stick and I'm like, whoo, my job is done. And then Tori is off and we're in the lead at this point. And it's, um, we're in the semifinals. So you know, it wasn't too much pressure. And so I'm wearing the lead. So I'm at that point, I'm relaxed. And, and so the same exchange that the men dropped the stick, you know, we're approaching that same exchange, the last one. And Tori gets the Lauren. And then the next minute, I see it, the, like everybody pass us and we're still in the zone. And I'm like, what just happened? And then I realized the baton is on the ground. And so I fall to the track and I, I had like, I remember falling to the track and like, hitting the track hard with my hands and just like crying out and and just letting it out right there. And I hopped up and just as quickly as I like had that moment, um, I knew I had to walk off and face, you know, what was next. And I get to um, Tori and she was bent over, you know, in the middle of the track. And at this point, no one's left on the track, but the two of us. And she was bent over and I was like, come on, Tori, you know, you know, let's go. And she was like, no, I can't move. You know, I really can't move. And I'm like, I got you, Tori, you know, whatever you need me to do. Like, you know, when she said, no, she, I really can't move. And so I remember lifting her body in my, my hands and she was just dead weight. And I just lifted her body up until she can like have the strength to do it on her own. And I held her for a second. And then she was able to get up and just, keep walking and we move forward together, but it immediately switched about being uh, disappointed and upset. 
um, and to being there for my teammate, because I mean, that's what the relays are about. I mean, you have four people that are trying to do this one goal. And sometimes, you know, when something like that happens, you know, you got to think about, you know, what she's dealing with in that moment, because although, you know, it's a team and we, you know, are disqualified, she is going to hold that moment um, dear to her um, being involved in the failed past. And so I just wanted to be there for her in that moment uh, of absorbing all of that. And so, you know, that's what it was. It was, it was about my teammate at that point, And we were able to both walk off together. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and and that, that was a hard moment. Um, but, but going through it, uh, I, I'd imagine you're able to, you know, especially in your coaching role now, you're able to take lessons from that uh, to, to the athlete, athletes that you work with now. Well, yes. I mean, well, one thing um, as a coach, I won't. Well, first of all, as a coach, I'm not taking away the opening ceremonies. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. For sure. Um, you know, uh, I, I, and I thought, you know, funny thing is I thought I would not coach, um, but coaching has changed my life um, and helping me learn from who, you know, the, the athletes that I work with and helping me in my role as a leader um, and how I can impact others in communities and in the next generation. And so, you know, after I, I went on after the Olympic games to run, um, my plan was to make another Olympic team, but I, I was, I ran for another year and I had a career ended injury with my back. And, um, a few years after that, I got a call and it was from USA track and field. And they were asking me if I was interested in coming on to help coach the, in the relay program. And so, I mean, I was like, what, of course. And so, yeah, I've, I've been I've been coaching since 2015 now. I, I coach uh, the junior and the senior national teams, working with some of the fastest women and men um, from ages 16 through the um, you know older ages with the elite teams. And so, I'm sorry, with the um, senior teams. And so, um, you know, as a coach, you know, I try to do my best to make them understand not just the tangible outcomes. Of course, we want to win. Of course, you know, my job is to add to the, the medal counts um, as best as possible, but also the intangibles that come out of these opportunities, you know, the, the experiences you gain, the the friendships you gain, the lessons you gain. And, and so I want to make sure um, in our wins and in our losses that not only are we developing them um, in the sport, but just overall as a person. Wow. Well, we we, uh, we definitely look forward to to what's coming up in, in Tokyo in 21 here. And you're you're really active with an organization uh, called Track Girls, which which uh, you helped to, to found and and which you do, to do a lot of work with. And I'm wondering if you can just tell us about uh, about Track Girls and what it's all about. Yeah. So, um, you know, after I retired from running, I went back into ad agency life and um, have been was working in um, different um, marketing agencies um, over the course of, I would say, about five years um, after I retired. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time, you know, I had just got that call um, from USA Track and Field. So I was going back into the sport and and then I was thinking about, you know, I was working back in advertising. I was like, you know what? I can't imagine like just working in corporate America without having impact um, in my sport um, anymore. Right? Like, I know I'm going to be coaching, but I want to help girls have the opportunity and the access that I had um, that changed my life and um, in multiple ways, you know, provided me with the opportunity at a higher education, a travel in the world. Um, the different people I've met um, from all over the world. Um, and I wanted to be the access point. You know, my mom always taught me, you know, you want to try things out so you can find yourself, find your voice. And she knew exposure was important and access was important. And so that's what I wanted to translate um, for the future. And so I've been called a track girl since I was 14 when I started. Um, and so, you know, it was a term that was already coined. And so I was like, you know what, let me trademark this because, you know, a track girl is a brand, you know, I'm in branding, I'm in marketing. Yeah. Um, I see talented, influential women around me every single day. And one of the things that I learned while I was back in, um, at my morning, my marketing agencies, you know, I was wondering why they never had track and field athletes on their roster. 
And I remember him telling me that, you know, track and field athletes are only relevant uh, during the Olympic Games. And I did not find that to be true. And so I wanted to make sure that I provided a consistent platform to help share these stories uh, and help expose these um, women in particular um, because of my own personal experience on how um, we can influence communities and people and, um, and make impact, not just during the Olympic year or in the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, Track Girls was born. You know, I, I just added a Z to it to give it some flair um, and to make sure my trademark uh, was approved. Uh, so it wouldn't be too general. <laughs> Good for you. Right. Um, and so Track Girls was born. And, you know, I started out with workshops to make sure I gave girls direct access to world class athletes and coaches. And since I had that network, um, then I wanted to make sure they had those mentorship opportunities, that direct access. Um, giving them access to different um, girls that were involved in the sport as well so they can build their, those peer relationships, really build that sisterhood vertically through the mentorships and horizontally through the peer relationship. Um, and then the core values that, you know, were important to me to, for me to be successful, you know, self-expression. Track and field is um, the number one participatory sport for middle and high school girls, you know, and Um, It really embraces diversity and inclusion, you know, from um, different types of bodies. Um, We have the Paralympics, so people with physical disabilities are able to compete in our sport. Um, You you can run, jump, throw. So no matter if you're short or tall or or, or bigger or or smaller, um, it's an event for you to embrace and to be embraced. And so... I wanted to help them um, really establish these core values that are learned in our sport from self-expression to having a vision, to have your goals and uh, poise. You know, what I learned for myself and keeping your composure uh, and excellence, you know, your daily habits. And so I I have these core values so we can empower them um, to be successful in and out of the sport. And then, of course, you want to offer grants, you know. Grants that really remove any barriers to help girls have access to sport, help girls have access to movement. And then we just use track and field as that vehicle. You don't have to be involved in track and field to be a part of track girls. You know, track girls is just using the women involved in the sport to help motivate you and inspire you along your path and and using track and field um, as an access point to sport and movement in general. And so I've been doing track girls since 2015. I founded it in 2015. Um, now, um, you know, we've been a nonprofit since 2018, officially a 501c3. Yep. Um, and so um, it, it's been a blessing for me to be able to uh, continue to impact uh, the future generation as a coach and now um, as a philanthropist and giving girls opportunity and using the sport to fulfill their dreams. That's so good, and 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 uh, and we and we honor the work that you do, and 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 completely uh, support you in that. Um, and so, how can people um, get a hold of you here? So we we flashed up track girls, and I'll flash some of your social media as you talk here. Yeah, I mean, so if you go to um, my, our Instagram is at track girls. So just think about, like I said, with the Z. So T R A C K and girls with the Z. Um, we are on Instagram. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook as well, Track Girls. Anytime you do Track Girls with a Z in Google or anything, you'll find Track Girls. <laughs> um, we are the only girls track and field empowerment program, nonprofit organization um, that's out there. Um, and so, you know, you you look for Track Girls with a Z, you will find us. You can also follow me on my personal Instagram. It's Michelle Lewis Freeman. And, um, you know, that you can follow on my personal journey as well. How, you know, cons- you know we want to have these conversations on how we increase diversity in the running community. I want to be a part of those conversations to, you know, how we continue to expose um women and girls involved in the sport and the impact that um, we can have on um, the future generations. And, and so, you know, um, you know, follow, follow, I want to have street races, you know, where I'm talking and and talk now of bringing opportunity to increase sprinting opportunities and the everyday um, running community. You know, when you think about the road racing and the running community, 
you know, you have opportunities to do 5Ks and 10Ks and half marathons and marathons, but not a lot of everyday runners sprint. Um, but the funny thing is, is that during the Olympics, you know, people are excited to, you know, watch the sprinters and the sprinters um, hold down the medal count uh, for track and field. But yet in between Olympic years, it's all about road racing and, and, and um, the distance community. And so how can we bridge that gap and get people to um, everyday fitness community, everyday runners to be interested in sprinting? And so I really want to be a part of the conversations and educating people to, um, to understand uh, the benefits of speed training, how you incorporate that, whether you're a distance runner, um, a, a trail runner, an ultra marathon runner, um, whatever that is, you know, a triathlete, whatever type of athlete you are, you know, how we can, um, how I can educate them on the um, benefits of speed training, but also the technicalities of uh, how you can get faster. Um, so making people understand sprint mechanics, how to run properly. Um, so yeah, I mean, follow me on Instagram. I have some good plans coming up for 2021 from the street race opportunities, from the partners that I'm having conversations with right now um, that we're going to announce that we're, we know who I'm working with in 2021. And then, of course, for track girls, you know, what we're going to do in 2021, especially with our grant program and how we are really getting the resources, which has been a blessing. Uh, but really finally starting to get resources poured into um, track girls to really um, actualize um, the vision that I, that I have. So good. Uh, and, and, and we, we should talk about this cause I think you're still doing these, the Airbnb experience, the mind and body masterclass. So, uh, you can tell us what's that, what that's about too. Oh my goodness. So, um, you know, Olympic year was originally of course, 2020. So Airbnb partnered with the international Olympic committee to offer what they call experiences. So these are, um, you know, whether you want to create workouts or motivational speaking or cooking classes or wine tasting or whatever that is, you can create these experiences and they were originally in person. So they would give opportunities for people to book, um, your experience. And then I was going to, I was going to create an in-person like workout and speaking opportunity. But then when the pandemic hit, the Airbnb came to us, um, to the, the, um, certain Olympic athletes and said, would you be interested in trying to see if this can work virtually. And so they turned um, the experiences to online experiences. And so I created what I call the mind and body masterclass. And what I do is I take uh, people through a track and field inspired workout. Like it's a hit format though. So if you think about like full body movements that I would use to support speed development, um, then I take them through a hit training um, uh, program like that. And then I ended with my Olympic journey and take them on a roadmap on how to actualize dreams and how to make, you know, just talk about, um, you know, attaining goals. And so I use my Olympic journey to do that. And that two year period of when I left YNR and when I actually walked into that Olympic stadium. And so um, it's been um, so great. You know, I've worked with corporate teams. So this has been amazing for corporate teams. So this can work for someone who has 150 people or I've done one-on-ones, you know, I've done small groups. I've worked with a track team in Singapore. I've, I've worked with, um, you know, I've worked with someone gifted this to their father. Um, and I, I did a one-on-one -on -one with someone who was in Mumbai, it, um, India. So, oh, awesome. yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's been so great, um, over the last six months and 100% of the proceeds goes to track girls. And so, um, to be able to pour in the resources this way that I wasn't even uh, forecasting um, this year, um, Airbnb experiences has turned out to be a door for track girls that um, has really created opportunity um, for us to fund our programs. And so um, you uh, can find, you know, go to Airbnb experiences. Hopefully you can share the link. Um, and, and, and check it out, whether you're by yourself or you have a friend or you have a group of people, you know, just look on there and we can uh, and spend some time together and do the mind and body masterclass with Michelle. So good. So good. Uh, Michelle, this has been a pleasure. We wish you all the best as you inspire the next generation of track girls and, and your work with, with, the uh, USA, uh, track, um, a track and field and athletics and, and helping people be the leaders of tomorrow. 
Yes. No, thank you for your time here. It's a pleasure to meet you. And, you know, like I said, and when you think about leadership, you know, think about, you know, who you are, because it starts with that, you know, think about your core values. Um, think about like aligning everything to what matters the most to you. You know, what do you enjoy to do? Uh, where do you feel your strongest? When do you feel your bravest? You know, those things that matter the most to you, you know, as you make your choices, as you make your decisions, um, embrace who you are, embrace your qualities, embrace yourself um, and, and let your voice shine through. Um, because those are the qualities that were put into you for a reason. And in order for you to be a leader, you need to be yourself. And so I tell everybody to really, you know, start with thinking about those things, those intrinsic things that bring out who you are and that matter the most to you that are closest to your heart. And you will lead people um, simply by being yourself. Thank you so much. What a phenomenal interview. Just an amazing view of the mind. Uh, in her words, the mind is a tricky place. And uh, Michelle Lewis Freeman just is a masterclass on mindset mastery. Impossible is nothing, all the mantras she has, all the verses from scripture and, and faith playing such an important role. And she follows the law of sacrifice, kind of feeding the good and starving the bad out of her life, just laser focused on her goal. It's amazing to think if, if you just put ourselves in her shoes, lining up against some of the top women, absolutely the top women in the world, uh, including Olympic and three time world champion Allison Phoenix, just one of the who, who herself is one of the greatest athletes of all time to become one of the four women to make the world championship team in the four by 100 meter this after only two years uh what, what stands out for me is the deep well of faith that she relies on and the the very profound self-assurance that she has in her own words better be real and, and she found a way to to make that that real for her she ran for one of the top uh, u.s college track coaches in the u.s and it, and it pays off when she, and she impresses the u.s national team coach and and lands herself a spot uh, on that squad and, and running and it, it's a difficult end to their to the olympic story with the drop baton but now she's become herself one of the top coaches in the world with one of the top teams in the world and it's really no surprise if you think about the development and all the maturity she has uh, with her mindset and and i'm, I'm sure she's just a, a really great source of inspiration and and uh, coaching for for that team and those athletes uh, whether you were an elite athlete or in, in business or uh, just life in general, coaches can help us. I've worked with uh, world champions, business people, moms, dads, entrepreneurs, and I've experienced the the, the benefits of coaching myself and I, I wanted to, to give back. If you'd like to find out more, please check out evolutionofleaders.com. Send me a note. I'd love to hear from you. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you so much.